uh, your lecture on radiation effects and then right. on North Korea. And then I'll, I'll be uh, quick about it because I know that this is a rich topic that Mansouk has okay. with okay. personal experience. So We've got all of Wednesday too to discuss Good. it. But we'll have a chance, maybe the four of us to talk about the slides of the four teams and get some yes. collective view about that. Okay. Mansouk, how many students do we have there? We have 22 students. 22? Yes, sir. Okay, that's good. Okay. So I have 210, shall we begin? Yep. Okay. Well, welcome back class. Uh, this is Michael Nacht with uh, Professor Van Bibber and Austin and Mansook. We're now into the final two weeks of the semester. So today we want to hear first from the, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We want to hear first from the China group of the crisis simulation to review their presentation and their slides. And then uh, we'll go right into Professor Van Bibber's uh, presentation on radiation effects. And then we'll begin Mansook's discussion on North Korea. And Mansook will follow up with a full discussion on North Korea on Wednesday. So that's the plan for this week. Any questions or issues about the class before we begin? Okay, and also I'm holding office hours on Wednesday, 10.30 to 11.30, if there are students who want to chat. So if you want to chat, please email Mansook or myself um, that you do want to chat and I'll be on, okay? Okay, so back to the China group. Who's going to present? Um, can everyone see the slides? Okay, I, I see the first slide, China. Okay. In the line. All right. Um, hold on. I'm going to turn on my camera also if I can figure that out. All right. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Kaylee Kinnett, the president of China. The People's Republic of China would like to thank President Trump, or I guess President Clara for calling together these four party talks and everyone for agreeing to have a productive discussion during these trying times of the coronavirus pandemic. Although a formal agreement between all parties might not be met, we remain optimistic that this can set the stage for further cooperation and negotiation. Slow down a little, slow down a little. Okay. Slow. Uh, we appreciate the hard work that has already been done to set forth agreements and believe these initial agreements make a great framework that a larger and more comprehensive deal can be built upon. Today, we would like to talk to you all about our goals for this negotiation, as well as some alternative goals should those not be met. We would also like to outline our negotiation strategy for approaching the other parties during these talks, as well as how we seek to address the concerns of those other parties. Should any of that be unclear or require clarification, we would invite you all to ask any questions and we will elaborate. I would now like to warmly welcome our chief of staff to outline our overall goals for this negotiation exercise. Thanks, Kaylee. My name is Juhi. I'm the Chief of Staff, and I'd like to review the general goals with you. So firstly, we would like to denuclearize North Korea. We don't want any missile testing in North Korea. We want to maintain regional power, regional stability. North Korea should be recognized as a sovereign state. We strongly oppose increased U.S. presence in the Korean Peninsula and we strongly oppose any anti-ballistic missiles and or bases with nuclear deterrent capability within the Korean Peninsula. Next slide, please. Um, hello, I'm Christian as the National Security Advisor in China. I'm here to provide you with a more detailed outline of our ideal and alternative goals throughout this negotiation process. Um, so firstly, again, we're looking to negotiate against sanctions, um, which is going to appease North Korea as well as negotiate for light water revision, uh, light water reactor provisions uh, for North Korea. Uh, that will be one of the more difficult negotiation points that we have. Uh, similarly, we will be negotiating for the dismantling of thermonuclear weapons, which appeases both South Korea and the United States. Uh, and lastly, we're looking to negotiate for a reduced 
US military presence in South Korea and Japan, uh, more specifically reduce strike capabilities and ballistic missile defense systems, uh, such as the terminal high altitude area defense anti-missile systems that are currently in, in South Korea. Um, all altern our alternative goals are relatively similar. Um, in a worst case scenario situation, we're looking to at least reduce economic sanctions on North Korea without the light water re reactor provisions. Um, we're also still looking to reduce uh, the amount of US air bases and potential strike capabilities in South Korea and Japan. And again, ultimately we're looking to dismantle the thermonuclear weapons in North Korea. Um, so next we'll be moving on to China's standpoint and negotiation strategies. Excuse me, could I just ask uh, on the third bullet, go back a second, on the third bullet, dismantling of thermonuclear weapons. Now, North Korea has fission weapons and thermonuclear weapons. Are you just calling for dismantlement of the thermonuclear weapons, but not the fission weapons? Um, no, um, I'm sorry, that was a mistake on my part. We're looking to dismantle all nuclear weapons uh, within North Korea. North Korea. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, uh, hello, everyone. 大家好,我是中国国防部部长李俊荣. Uh, I'm the China, uh, China's Defense Minister Li Junrong, and I'd like to talk about China's standpoint in Korea issue. Uh, China firmly stands for denuclear resolution on the uh, Korea Peninsula, maintaining peace and stability there and resolving the problems through dialogue. The related parties should bear their responsibilities, take practical measures to ease tension, and resume peaceful talk and negotiation in order to solve the Korean Peninsula issue. The DPRK is clear about China's opposition to its nuclear test. Regardless of the timing, North Korea launching a nuclear test is against the United Nations Security Council's resolution and against the will of the international community. As a member of the UN Security Council, China will cooperate with the UNSC and ensure the implementing of a reasonable and necessary resolution. China has proposed the suspension for suspension strategy based on development of the situation. The suspension for suspension proposal is to call for the DPRK to suspend its nuclear and missile activities in exchange for the suspension of joint military exercise of US and the Republic of Korea. And we also want to emphasize that after a long historical development to this day, uh, the Korea Peninsula issue is not created by any single side alone, and we can't press the responsibility for solving the problem on any side alone. All parties should concern, uh, all parties concerned should have an uh, open attitude and willing to meet each other halfway. And we hope that all parties would act cautiously to preserve peace and stability. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm Rithka, I'm the Director of National Intelligence. And essentially the next thing that we wanted to look at is given our standpoint and our stance within the negotiation, um, what we believe our biggest issues or concerns will be with all the other countries at the negotiating table. Um, so kind of understanding and gaining intelligence and knowledge of all the other countries, particularly what they want from this negotiation and are hoping to gain, um, as well as any particular pain points that we might have with them in particular. Um, looking at the United States, I think that the United States agrees with us on our stance of denuclearizing North Korea, as well as stabilizing the Korean Peninsula. And at the current situation, kind of combating the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, I think that some of the potential issues that could arise um, between China and the United States is that China doesn't necessarily appreciate um, the United States' continuous and increased military presence within South Korea, um, particularly and all across the Korean Peninsula. Um, especially considering that the United States has given South Korea like an advanced missile defense system. Um, we believe that like continuously putting more troops in South Korea by the United States um, kind of impacts the entire region. Um, so another potential issue kind of building just off of that is like the United States violating other nations or the regions as a whole's sovereignty, especially because they aren't anywhere near the Korean Peninsula, unlike China. Um, and then finally, given the current situation with the pandemic, um, a constant blame game that's been coming from the United States regarding the pandemic is just not acceptable. Next slide. Hey, 大家好, good, good day to you. 我是, 
中国解呃人民解放军的大将军。I am the PL 呃、uh, People's Liberation Army General Chairman. I only answer to the 呃、uh, our Communist Party Chairman herself. And 呃、uh, 我们希望有大家的合作，也也有韩国的合作。We hope to have the cooperation of everyone and the cooperation of South Korea. Now we both agree. Uh, we hope that South Korea will agree with us and cooperate with us in the carrying out of our plans. We both want to denuclearize North Korea, and we both want to agree to work together to work on COVID-19 in North Korea because this pandemic threat is very extensive. We also wish to in withdraw increased military presence in the South with the U.S., as was described earlier. Uh, we will. And this will actually、uh, give North Korea one less incentive for a nuclear arms race. So it's a suspension for suspension kind of strategy, as highlighted earlier. Now we understand that the Republic of Korea wants、uh, us to place sanctions on North Korea,、uh, but our policy,、uh, as of today, will be neither to neither confirm nor deny any willingness to place sanctions on the North in the. In the、uh, evolving situation,、uh, one thing is clear: we believe that war is beneficial to no party, and we will prevent it at all costs without compromising compromising China's security or North Korea's sovereignty and the general peace and stability of the region. So, yeah, next slide, please. Yes,、um, and also we we hope that、uh, North Korea,、uh, South Korea, will not continue to build up、uh, costly. Anti-ballistic missiles. We do not like that.、Um, neither、uh, we, do we want extra military presence. We hope that there will be de-escalation of all conflict, so as to reduce tension and increase economic trade and cooperation on COVID-19. So, if you do this, it will be beneficial on your end because you'll spend less money on the military and more money on dealing with、uh, urgent problems at hand. Now, our policy is that we are strongly against the building up of ABNs and extra nuclear deterrents by the U.S. and、uh, South Korea in the Korean Peninsula. Okay, we are opposed to conventional force build up in the South, and please do keep the status quo and do not raise tensions in response to the North, so that we can all preserve sovereignty and peace in the Korean Korean Peninsula. So I'll pass on to the next person. Next slide, please.、Yeah. Hi everyone.、Uh, I'm Masmo, the Foreign Minister for China. So regarding North Korea, the Chinese President and I met with members of the North Korean delegation a few weeks ago now to discuss the strength agreement.、Uh, we agree with their assessment that the economic sanctions that have been placed against them are an act of aggression. These sanctions have seriously hindered the development of the North Korean economy and the development of their nation as a whole. Removing them would allow the DPRK to grow and prosper, and help eliminate the need for such drastic measures as nuclear weapons. We believe that reverting these sanctions would start us on the path towards denuclearization. Now, as for the mutual security agreement, China is open to beginning talks with the North Korean delegation. However, we did not agree with the mutual security terms and had that removed from the strength agreement before signing. In order to sign on to the security section, we would need to see some more benefits thrown our way. At this time, the agreement seems one-sided, as we do not believe that the North Koreans possess the manpower or resources to aid any country but their own. Uh, if China were attacked, this delegation does not expect the North Koreans to be of much help. Now, as for our national policies, when North Korea is involved, our primary goal here is to prevent war from breaking out. There is a very delicate balance on the peninsula that could be disturbed at any moment, possibly hurting Chinese interests or even bringing our troops into harm's way.、Uh, and we know that Kim is prone to some questionable and rash decisions, so it is our hope to alleviate some of these tensions among the North Koreans. And prevent any sudden or unexpected actions that could lead to unforeseen consequences. To do this, and to do so, we intend to maintain our current relationship with North Korea.、Uh, in times such as these, it is important that the DPRK has an ally to support them with all matters, COVID or otherwise.、Uh, next slide. Overall, our nation seeks a stable Korean peninsula and a prosperous Democratic People's Republic of Korea that holds a place as a respected, responsible member of the international community. The People's Republic of China thanks you for your kind attention and would like to invite any questions you may have for our delegation.
Okay. Do we have some time for some questions, uh, Mensup? Yeah, uh, they have a uh, time for uh, answering questions. So if you have any questions to China's team, please ask questions. I have a question. Could you go back to, it's around slide three. Um, let's see, it's near the beginning, maybe slide three or four or so. Let's see, what slide is that now? I think it's four. Okay, go back one. Three yes, four. Right, stop right there. Um, uh, can you go into more detail about your first bullet, reduced economic sanctions without light water reactor provisions? Uh, or, uh, could you expand that for me a little bit? What, what um, are you looking for in terms of light water reactor provisions? Um, yeah, so in an ideal situation, we're looking for uh, North Korea to have the capability to create uh, light water reactors as a viable uh, source of energy for the country. Um, this is an alternative goal where, um, let's say that's a non-negotiable point that potentially then we could um, remove the capability uh, or rather not argue for the capability uh, of North Korea to build light water reactors. Um, so this is more just uh, considering should we not be able to negotiate for North Korea to have light water reactors um, during this process. Thank you. Um, I had a question that I posed in the chat for China. Um, so uh, North, I'm wondering is North Korea's uh, COVID problem extensive or not? Uh, by the way, my name is Sam and I'm with uh, US uh, Director of Intelligence. Um, in North Korea's presentation, they stated that they had it under control. Uh, if it is indeed extensive, then what uh, could their motivations be for covering it up? What implications does this have for this discussion? And I acknowledge that James responded, but I did want to hear a response from China. Well, can I go for this? I'll go for this. Yeah, okay, so um, even, okay, let's say we have this best case scenario where uh, North Korea is not covering up and there's indeed like no COVID cases. Well, the COVID virus, COVID-19 virus has shown potential to grow exponentially in a very, very short amount of time. So that even if they have it under control now, it would still be in their benefit to receive any technical expertise or aid so as to flatten the curve early on and not uh, allow this spread to go uncontrolled uh, um, in their country. And um, yeah, uh, currently they're zero, but uh, we of course make the provision that there's cover up and or whatnot, but uh, that, that's for the side of argument, okay? But um, if there is, then the spread could be extensive and it will still wreck the economic and healthcare system if uh, it is going on. Either way, uh, it is only a matter of time before things get really serious. And it kind of uh, has, uh, I mean, the end result in a few, in a matter of time will be the same anyhow. You will, they will need aid. Thank you, Theo. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, this is Hevo from the South Korea group. Uh, I want to ask about uh, your positions on um, removing U.S. troops uh, from South Korea. Uh, because based on uh, historical evidence, there are two major uh, troop uh, re reductions uh, of the U.S. troops, about 30%. Between the 1969 to 1971 and 2004 to, 2000 to 2005. And the outcomes of that uh, have been uh, attributed to uh, North and South Korea conventional buildup. Uh, North Korea, they test nuclear device right after the uh, uh, troop reductions uh, of 2005. And there's also um, some, some tensions begin to build up as well. So how can you justify your stand on uh, reducing troop would help with, uh, with North Korea from testing or reduce the tension there? 
Oh, oh, you go for it. You go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that just to clarify, we weren't advocating for a full um, U.S. troop removal. I think that like the biggest thing is that if we do end up negotiating this deal and North Korea denuclearizes completely, the threat itself is reduced. Um, and like we understand there's some necessity for U.S. troops in South Korea, but not necessarily to such a large extent and definitely no need to like increase the troop presence. Um, and I think someone else from my group can also expand on this. Uh, yeah, to build off that a little bit, um, one of the major concerns is that um, the United States has so much influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so what we're looking at is a Western country essentially um, having as much power and influence um, or more than uh, for the majority of the regional countries. So um, with the increased uh, military strength uh, that China has been building over time um, and that other regional countries uh, have gained as well, a reduction in the US presence uh, we don't think would necessarily be likely to cause any uh, larger buildup or conflict uh, within the Korean Peninsula, uh, just because now there are more checks in regional powers. Uh, so a reduction in U.S. forces would ultimately just increase the sovereignty of the countries in the Indo-Pacific region and allow it to be a more uh, self-governed uh, area as opposed to just having the United States' influence um, kind of majorly pressure different countries into certain political stances and such. Um, this is the Lorenzo Vergari from Republic of Korea, um, the foreign minister. I have a couple of questions regarding the, uh, the rollback of the U.S. Army deployment in South Korea. Uh, the China team must be aware of the fact that uh, in South Korea, there is an anti-Chinese uh, thought among the population. So the relationship on an economical and cultural standpoint in recent years haven't been great between our countries. Uh, don't you believe that demanding and coercing uh, uh, removal of the U.S. Army from South Korea, so uh, adopting a posture that uh, requires other countries to to develop actions on their own countries, so on national grounds. Don't you believe that could also even more arm the relationship on economical terms between Republic of Korea and China? Because we are aware of recent uh, developments that have weakened the economical benefits, such as, for example, the closure of the uh, Hyundai car factories in China. And this has led to significant drawbacks on economic terms for both countries. Aren't you afraid that could even worsen the economic situation to have such a stance? Should I go? Yeah, I'll go for this. Um, okay, I'd like to have you postulate the alternative that means to if, let's say you have this increase um, increase uh, military presence in South Korea now let's say you have that or you you have more deterrence and whatever what not have you uh, if given that um, we already have a reduced presence and it still builds up tension can you imagine what would happen if you would have more presence, more military presence, and that would actually uh, give rise to more tensions. How much worse would this uh, situation you described? How much worse would it be? Yes. So to reply to your comment, uh, we are not asking for an increased presence. We are asking for maintaining the status quo, uh, which we believe is a fair deployment of U.S. troops in the Korean Peninsula, and it is guaranteeing the regional stability. We believe that having China asking South Korean people uh, to have a lower security level by not having these joint exercises with the US and not having all these troops deployed could worsen the perspective of the population of China uh, from because of China. People in, in short uh, will start to increase their negative thoughts against the Chinese uh, Republic. And that, on, on my perspective as a foreign minister, uh, would have significant impacts on trade between the two countries and in the long run would damage the economic relationship, which now are even more weak and fragile due to the COVID pandemic condition. 
So just to make it clear, we're not asking for more trips. We are asking for maintaining the status quo. Okay. Um, could, then to, oh, what's again? Oh, you want to go for it? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think the the idea is that um, by giving these individual countries in the Indo-Pacific region uh, an increase in sovereign power by reducing the influence the United States has, um, you obviously do run the risk of increasing regional tensions. Um, but I think that ultimately the shared goal, um, because currently there isn't necessarily very many um, shared goals throughout the countries within the Indo-Pacific region, um, but with all of the countries coming together to, to support something like the denuclearization of uh, North Korea, um, I think that together with this increased sentiment of um, kind of a common goal and a shared sentiment to uh, reduce the North Korean nuclear capabilities um, or to remove them outright uh, would kind of foster a relationship of bringing uh, the countries in the region together, uh, as well as, again, by increasing their sovereignty, um, it might be able to mitigate any of the influence that the United States has on the perspective uh, that countries have uh, for one another within the region. Okay, and I'll go to add on to that. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, yeah. I'll just go. Okay. Um, yeah, con yeah, you, you say that um, us demanding a decrease of military presence in South Korea uh, is going to, um, yeah, it's a little too much on that end. So I'd like you to also consider North Korean's perspective because you're telling them to reduce their defense uh, by dismantling all nuclear weapons. How are you, um, and then it's going to, that itself is going to uh, upset some balance of power. So how can you demand uh, someone else to cut off their defenses without doing it yourself? Yes, thank, thanks for the great question. Uh, I want to, to clarify that uh, during the last meeting we had, uh, there was a very shared intent be among the US, North Korea and South Korea on a shared deal that included a significant reduction of the nuclear arsenal in North Korea without, uh, remo without removing the US army from the Korean Peninsula. So that's just to answer that we are not threatening the sovereignty of the, the DPRK because they would be in favor of such a deal. On the other end, with China entering a domestic policy question by removing, by, by asking the withdrawal of the uh, U.S. Army from Korean territory, that would upset the domestic stability of our country, we believe. Okay, if North Korea's, I guess we, we could reach a concession after further discussion. If North Korea's really willing to do it, then we can discuss with them and yeah, we can see what, the, what kind of deal we can work out. It seems plausible as long as their interests are taken care of and the regional stability and power balance is also taken care of. I'd like to um, be respectful of Mansook and Professor Van Bibber's time. So if there are any further questions, I would probably prefer for you to email us or something so we can get on to the rest of the lectures for class. I'd like to just ask one more question, if I may. I'm Max Wallace, the National Security Advisor for the DHB South Korea. How credible is the sanctions offer from China when they will neither confirm nor deny the sanctions given the extensive smuggling between China and North Korea in commodities such as coal and oil that are already banned under UN sanctions? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Your, uh, the volume was relatively low coming from your end. Yeah, I have a rough internet connection. My question is, China is neither willing to confirm nor deny that they will apply sanctions as a means of North Korean compliance. 
but China and North Korea already trade in violation of UN sanctions in coal, oil, and other goods. So how is that a credible saying? Um, I think the, uh, the key point that we're looking to make is a reduction in sanctions uh, or removal outright uh, with North Korea. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily much to comment on on the current state of uh, sanctions is obviously we um, don't necessarily uh, support the sanctions that are uh, currently placed on North Korea. Um, so ultimately one of the, the major goals and I think one of the only ways to have uh, all of the parties satisfied uh, which include, which would include the denuclearization of North Korea would be for uh, a significant reduction or an outright removal of the sanctions. Uh, so I think the current status of the sanctions isn't something that, uh, of other sanctions isn't something that necessarily uh, is what we're considering, more just what the status of the sanctions going forward will be in order to appease ourselves, North Korea, um, and then obviously through their denuclearization of peace, South Korea and the United States. Any comments, Professor Nock and Bieber, on overall uh, uh, stance, you know, uh, crisis simulation? Well, let me thank the China team and all four teams for, a, I think, was a, a well-informed and illuminating discussion. Um, we've um, studied the view graphs. We'll be talking about them. And if we have any questions, we'll get back in touch with you. But, but congratulations to all four teams. <clears throat> and good luck with your negotiations. Great. Okay, so shall we move uh, on to Professor Ann Bibber and radiation effects? Good. Mansuk, do I have the ability to share my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, what I'm going to do first is go back to the beginning of my uh, lecture here, put a full screen. Um, oh. oh, hold on. Good, here we are. Okay, I'm going to go now uh, to full screen. Oh. What happened here? Okay, let me unshare. Um, number two. Hold on, let's see here. I'm trying to go, oh, there. Okay, can everyone see the first slide and full screen? Yes, uh, they're Good. backwards. We see the presenter view right now. Okay. Good, so you're seeing are you seeing me? We can we can see the first and the second slide. Ah, okay. So what I want to if you do... go up to the top left of the corner, there's a swap displays button next to end show and use slideshow. And that uh, might let's see, I've got two screens. It would be oh, ah yes, there we are. How's there we that? go. Now we okay. can see it. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so let me make quick work of this so we can get back on to um, Mansuk's <clears throat> talk. Um, and <clears throat> um, this is uh, a, uh, a lecture we could do practically any time in the course, but it is very important because I think it is important to, for people to understand 
um, a couple of topics. One <clears throat> um, uh, is the effect of um, of um, a um, a supercritical reaction, a large scale supercritical reaction, which we call a a a bomb, a nuclear weapon, um, and. Uh, uh, the devastate, devastating, uh, the short-term, medium-term, and long-term effects um, um, it affects. And also, when we talk specifically about radiation, uh, there's um, um, uh, a, some detail we did not fill in in our earlier primer on nuclear physics. So let me show you perhaps um, about 20 slides or so in, in brief. Okay, um, I'm going to draw from... <coughs> Um, um, probably the best compendium or the best review um, of the nuclear weapons effects um, that uh, was published in 1977. It was um, uh, by uh, Glassstone and Dolan. Um, it was, um, uh, it's, it was um, released uh, for public release um, by ERDA, which was this, um, uh, the um, Energy Research and Development Administration which was um, existed br very briefly between uh, the end of the Atomic Energy Commission, AEC was absorbed into ERDA, and then um, ERDA in, um, uh, uh, I think, around 1979, 1980, um, I think, or maybe early 80s, under the Carter administration became the Department of Energy, as, uh, more or less as we know it today. Um, so you might say, well, that's a bit of an old reference, um, but I think most of the information in here is, is not changed. I will not show you, uh, we'll talk about <clears throat> um, this in the context of both smaller fission um, uh, weapons and also uh, when you, uh, the thermonuclear weapons uh, that came into existence in the early 50s. Um, we uh, talked about the first test of a uh, wet bomb, a DD cryogenic bomb um, that was tested uh, in 1952, uh, November 1st in the South Pacific, uh, which was the Ivy Mike shot. And you saw a brief uh, documentary on that. And then the um, uh, Castle Bravo that ran away from them and was a um, uh, intended to be a something like a six megaton bomb that ended up being a 15 megaton bomb or so, um, uh, and uh, the uh, enormous effects it had over a, a very, very wide region. In case you're interested, you might ask the question, what was the largest thermonuclear explosion um, ever detonated? And it was done in uh, October of 1961 by the Soviets um, uh, under Khrushchev. Um, it was called the Tsar Bomba. Uh, and um, it was there, it was mostly a political uh, tool. It was a three-stage weapon. It was a massive weapon that was airdropped with a parachute over in Nova Zemlya, where the Russians um, did uh, part of their um, testing um, and uh, no longer, um, but it is up in the um, Arctic Sea, the northernmost um, border of um, Russia with the, the, uh, the uh, with the uh, Arctic uh, Ocean. And um, it was airdropped at a height of 10.6 uh, kilometers and exploded about four kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Um, and it was a 50 to 56 megaton blast. Um, had they used a uranium tamper, it uh, could have produced 100 megatons or so. Um, the shockwave traveled around the Earth three times. Um, the um, the uh, plane that was, was a, a one of these very long range, uh, uh, specially modified Soviet bombers that did this test had to be specially modified to do the test, even at a range of, um, by the time the shock wave caught up with it, um, it was about 70 miles away and the plane uh, was scorched, dropped about a kilometer before the pilot was able to um, regain um, uh, his uh, uh, control of the plane, but they landed safely as well as the uh, jet plane with it. It was sort of a um, sort of a uh, accompanying it and uh, doing uh, some footage, uh, photographic footage. And you might just look that up on the web, the Tsar Bomba uh, there. And uh, even the Soviet generals, in fact, were kind of horrified by the yield of this thing. 
Uh, Harold Agnew, in fact, who observed a thermonuclear test in the South Pacific, said that unlike the Trinity test, um, you continued to feel the heat on your face for several minutes uh, at a range of, you know, 35 miles. And, and it really, I think, gave pause to the military people about uh, the significance of these bombs. Um, general categorization of the physical effects. Um, you have um, blast and shock, thermal radiation, uh, the initial, the prompt nuclear uh, and uh, uh, radiation, and then fallout in the case of um, surface um, or very low atmospheric um, uh, explosions. And we'll talk about each of these in sequence. Let me grab a, my water bottle here. Okay. Um, okay, this is old hat to you now in, uh, since 1945 here. 75 years. Um, we've um, um, conducted more than 2,000, uh, all nations have conducted more than 2,000 nuclear tests. Um, underground, um, what the, uh, uh, since 1962, um, and the atmospheric, um, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, which me meant uh, surface uh, or um, either low atmospheric or in a few cases, upper atmospheric, uh, explosions, uh, about 500, a little over 500, and 1,500 um, that were done uh, deep uh, underground or so. There were obviously, U.S. and um, the Russian Republic and former Soviet Union having done the vast majority of these. This is an old slide because, uh, as you see, North Korea has tested several times since 2006. Okay, we'll talk about um, their specific uh, uh, features of um, the burst types, um, and we'll we'll touch on each of these in the, in sequence as we go through uh, the discussion, um, <clears throat> and, and uh, particularly uh, talking about air bursts, uh, which is of course um, in in general the um, the uh, sort of the sort of the uh, design intention or the uh, the intended uh, design usage of these things in uh, warfare. Um, the um, uh, if you look at the kind of the energy budget of uh, the release of energy in a, um, a nuclear thermonuclear explosion, you find that half the energy comes out in terms of a shock wave, uh, fifty percent uh, of the energy, um, thermal radiation. Uh, which of all uh, wavelengths um, uh, is about 35%. The bulk of that, uh, in fact, the prompt uh, radiation is in the form of um, X-rays um, from, um, because the, uh, of course, the temperature is so high that um, the um, all uh, atoms uh, in the um, immediate vicinity, the casing, the components, um, uh, and the fireball, uh, depending on the size, going out from uh, a kilometer to several kilometers is completely um, vaporized, and uh, and in some cases the atoms are fully stripped. And of course, as the electrons hop back onto the atoms, you get, um, uh, of course, initially some very very high energy X rays, many keV, and then as the fireball cools, um, uh, the um, uh, sort of lower or longer wavelength thermal uh, radiation. Um, the uh, radiation itself, in terms of uh, neutrons, gammas, and so forth, the specifically nuclear radiation uh, is a, a minority component. Um, a special category of that we'll talk about is fallout for, uh, for a uh, detonation which occurs um, on the Earth's surface or close enough to it that soil um, and uh, other stuff from the Earth's surface gets swept up and irradiated and then dispersed um, uh, in, the, uh, in the cloud. Okay, um, talk about the sequence of events. We talk about the fireball um, here and um, you have temperatures of tens of millions of degrees. Um, everything uh, is uh, vaporized uh, and turned into a plasma, i.e. a completely ionized state of uh, matter. And uh, for light elements, in fact, they will be fully stripped, all electrons will be taken off like that. Um, 
And um, this happens, uh, the, the, uh, the, the absorption uh, in the atmosphere of um, the radiation uh, is such that almost instantaneously um, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the ionization, the sphere of ionization called the fireball um, propagates outwards uh, almost immediately. Um, and, um, uh, and, um, and then we'll stop at some point. A rule of thumb, so you, you've seen the footage of the Trinity test, uh, the fireball was um, about a quarter of a mile in diameter, a, um, some uh, multi-megaton, 10 megaton a thermonuclear device, uh, the fireball will be on the order of um, a few miles. A very crude rule of thumb is, of course, the diameter of the fireball uh, it will go roughly as the cube root of uh, the total explosive energy of the, uh, um, uh, of, of the device. Okay, um, the formation of the fireball also, okay, there's the Trinity device, and uh, there was um, uh, a, a large uh, amount of uh, uh, electro-optical high-speed photography going on, so one could actually see at a uh, microsecond and some tens of microseconds to uh, some uh, milliseconds, tens of milliseconds, we actually have footage of that going on uh, all the way out. And we had our first understanding of, of um, you know, uh, uh, and we're able to do comparisons with the physics calculations of how the uh, explosion would uh, expand and, and propagate. Um, okay. Um, so the, in the case of tests that are done um, on the Earth's surface <clears throat> or um, uh, close to the ground, um, what will happen is that, uh, it, the, it, in fact, the prompt radiation from the explosion will irradiate um, the soil, the dirt, and give rise uh, to uh, short, medium, and long um, uh, lifetime uh, isotopes, and uh, this, um, the, let me show you to the next slide here, that's a, a very classic view of a, uh, <clears throat> of the, uh, the uh, mushroom, what's called the mushroom cloud associated with a nuclear weapon, and um, I think you saw uh, photographs or footage um, for both the fission and thermonuclear type uh, bombs previously. Uh, and at a great distance, you saw the shock wave coming, and then you would see, you know, entire forests be bent over, or in some cases, trees snapped at their, you know, at the, the trunks snapped at their base. But then within a matter of a few seconds, all of a sudden, you found a this violent hurricane, uh, you know, super hurricane-like wind going immediately in the opposite direction back towards the blast. And the reason is that, of course, when you, um, uh, this uh, device goes off uh, and you um, form the fireball, um, the, it, it expands such that its density, of course, is much, 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 much lighter, uh, much less dense than the atmosphere around it. And um, like a, um, uh, one, one can think of it as an extreme form of a, a hot air balloon. And then the, um, the fireball will begin rising up into the atmosphere at enormous speed and uh, draw up this column of, uh, uh, of uh, dust and gas um, and the, the dust having been irradiated by neutrons forming radioisotopes at very, very high speed. Um, in the case, um, I was uh, looking recently, reviewing the, you know, some of the, the stuff on the web about the Tsar Bomba in fact, um, it, even though it was uh, uh, detonated about 2.6 miles above the Earth's surface, um, you could actually see um, as it rose up, it actually sucked up a, a, a cloud of dust and smoke that joined the fireball. And uh, within a few minutes, this thing had reached and made a flat top 40 miles above the Earth's surface. That's like 200,000 feet. It was you know, a, a absolutely prodigious thing. Now, here's the thing, uh, and that is that um, it, depending on where the wind is blowing, of course, these radioisotopes 
will then be drift and, uh, and either drop out or rain out um, tens of miles, hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands of miles downstream from there, uh, depositing even lethal doses of radiation um, over the landmass or over open ocean um, that um, many, many, many miles away from, from that. If the burst is occurring at a sufficient altitude, of course, that doesn't happen. It, it's a, it will give rise to a much cleaner uh, burst with uh, very little remnant uh, uh, fallout uh, later on. The only things that are getting activated, of course, anything associated, the casing and the, the material associated, the fuel, un, unburnt fuel of, of the weapon itself. Okay. Um, this is, it talks about the air blast and the thermal uh, radiation. Um, the, um, let's see here. Yeah, here it mentions here for a megaton blast, the fireball is out beyond, well, way beyond a mile. Um, and, and the shock front already at three miles, just a, a matter of seconds after the, after the burst. Okay, um, we talked about this, about fallout. Um, now, the, uh, when the uh, fireball is formed, it's pushing out an enormous mass of the atmosphere, and, and therefore you get, as this thing expands, you, you actually get a shock wave, uh, where, which is a, a discontinuous uh, front, propagating front. It's a discontinuous in temperature, discontinuous in pressure, uh, discontinuous in density, and it's uh, running ahead at supersonic velocities. Um, and of course, uh, as this, as you saw in, in some of the footage before, you know, even uh, heavily, um, you know, reinforced structures get blown away like a house of cards. And this is a very interesting table here. This is from um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, people have not been uh, obviously uh, uh, friendly or partisan to uh, the Department of Defense, uh, uh, but they're very, you know, well-informed um, uh, critics of um, of sort of the the whole uh, sort of the whole nuclear weapons uh, enterprise. Um, uh, I think you know, as a, as a benchmark uh, in uh, English units, the atmospheric pressure at the Earth's surface is 14.7 pounds per square inch psi. And what's interesting is that if you have an overpressure of even a third, just a, a sort of a, only a th a, an overpressure of only a third of an atmosphere, uh, that will basically crush a light wooden structure, so five psi. Um, even reinforced concrete structures um, are blown away uh, when they're overpressure by slightly more than uh, an additional atmosphere or so. And then it uh, shows you uh, things which are hardened um, uh, storage bunkers, command bunkers, silos, and deep underground command facilities. Um, the uh, additional uh, pressures it takes to, um, you know, to destroy those. Um, as you know, even in, um, you know, countries like, uh, you've, as you have, may have read, about uh, in recent years, you know, people thinking out loud about scenarios about uh, uh, if push came to shove, what could one do about Iran's deeply buried facilities? And uh, it turns out uh, uh, precious little if things are, are buried uh, uh, deep enough and hardened sufficiently, um, uh, it's very, very difficult to take them out. We, um, I think uh, countries have uh, actually uh, studied, um, you know, obviously sort of paper studies about uh, the coupling one could achieve if one had a, uh, a reentrant uh, vehicle or a warhead uh, that was designed to penetrate into the earth a sufficient distance before detonating so that you got maximum coupling of the explosive power into a, that what would be a basically a seismic wave and even then, it's very, very difficult to take out deep underground command facilities um, that are sufficiently buried in there. I, I think uh, any uh, country with uh, can do any amount of civil engineering, I think, could, could certainly bury things that would be relatively untouchable even by nuclear weapons. What is interesting here in the lower panel um, is um, 
and I think this may have been on the previous slide as well, um, uh, when you say, well, what's the effect on the human organism? Uh, and it turns out um, by the time one gets an overpressure of um, <clears throat> um, even uh, a third or a half of an atmosphere, um, uh, that uh, will, will, I think, you know, would, would just, you know, normally, you know, uh, sort of crush the, uh, uh, the lungs of a, of a person like that. And, and, and uh, it, so there's sort of a 50% uh, percentage of a person being killed in that, with that kind of overpressure. Um, um, I was reading, a, I saw a very sad story of a, a couple of U.S. servicemen uh, in um, uh, Afghanistan, who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when a, I think it was a 500 pound bomb dropped by a B-52 that was even like a couple of hundred meters away. And of course, we're just killed by the, by the overpressure from, from the blast some years ago. Um, the, as you also know, um, you know, when we talked about the, um, the uh, uh, gun type uranium device, it, uh, Hiroshima and then the plutonium device at Nagasaki uh, there, they were uh, in fact uh, the uh, design, they were dropped by and brought down by parachute, <clears throat> exploded um, at a height of about, as I recall, about 1600 feet <clears throat> or 1800 feet. For each yield, um, if one wants to maximize the blast um, over, uh, over the, the area of blast that will knock down structures and so forth, um, of course, that will be a, a, a higher and higher height for each, um, you know, yield weapon one wants to, uh, uh, one is utilizing. This shows um, Lower Manhattan and shows you these circles uh, of a um, a uh, diameter, um, um, which is dropped at the optimal height to knock down structures. Uh, 15 psi or so, and you can see even in the case of a, you know, between 200 kilotons to megatons, which was relatively conventional uh, weapons, uh, 100 kilotons to a megaton in the stockpiles of U.S. and the Russian Federation. Uh, right now, um, these th things uh, have awesome capacity that would take out uh, most of New York City uh, and touch most bureau, uh, most of the, the boroughs of New York, I and mean, certainly, uh, essentially, uh, uh, a good part of uh, a good part of Manhattan, like that. This slide shows the radius, uh, the radii over which one can start firestorms, um, and you can see in the case of uh, uh, a uh, 200 kiloton uh, device. Um, you, uh, uh, when, when actually can start fires all, you know, or again, again, uh, in effectively every, every borough of New York uh, with a device like that. Um, let's turn to um, specifically radiation and the effects of radiation. Um, we touched on this once before, but um, we'll uh, do a quick reprise here of the four types of radiation. We have um, um, the alpha particles, which are uh, slow moving, multi MeV, 5 MeV, um, uh, helium nuclei like that. Um, they cause no problem to the human organism unless you ingest them. Um, problematically, if you breathe them and you get things uh, uh, in your lung like radon or what like, like that, um, in, in sort of intimate contact with, you know, um, uh, with uh, cell membranes uh, like that, um, um, they are easily stopped or shielded by, uh, uh, you know, your skin, dead skin, a uh, piece of paper or whatnot. Uh, but of course, they are very dangerous if ingested alpha emitters um, because they are uh, slow-moving heavy ions and therefore deposit, they have a very high, what's called DEDX, loss of energy per unit distance. Um, as charged particles slow down at the very end of the range the, where they're depositing most of the, the highest rate of energy per distance and um, therefore um, have a, a very high probability of causing double strand breaks of DNA and other cellular damage. Beta particles, of course, they're charged, they're electrons. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, but they're swiftly moving, typically relativistic, hundreds of kilovolts or a few MeV, typically uh, tens of keV to MeV type energies. Um, and uh, for most of the range, they will penetrate and give only very light ionization to the material they pass through, but then they'll be stopped by something sufficiently thin, a little piece of sheet metal uh, or uh, a board or something like that will, will stop them. Gamma rays and X-rays are deeply penetrating. Um, uh, they are, of course, will follow kind of an exponential uh, attenuation um, there. Um, and depending on energy, um, uh, in the case when you get up to MeV type gamma rays, will require a high Z material like, um, uh, like lead to effectively uh, stop them. Neutrons are very penetrating. And as we've discussed in terms of uh, moderators, the best thing to do to stop a neutron, of course, is, ha is to have it scatter repeatedly um, with hydrogenous material, protons being the same mass as a neutron, is the easiest way to degrade its energy and roughly it will lose a half uh, of its energy per scattering. So that's how you get it down to thermal energy. So uh, um, you know, having it scatter from water or from polyethylene or paraffin is a very good way of, of um, uh, slowing down and, and stopping those neutrons. Okay, um, in terms of, um, so we understand what, um, uh, you know, about radiation, uh, the energy deposition, and um, uh, I'm sort of coming from the old guard. I'm, I'm just catching up, but already many, many years ago, uh, they, the standardized units were changed. Um, the old um, 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 the unit for energy deposition per unit mass was known as the RAD. And it was uh, 0.01 joules per kilogram you may say, well, that's kind of an odd thing. Uh, it's really an erg per gram, since an erg is 10 to the minus five joules. So it'd be a millijoule, per, uh, it would be a, yeah, a, a, a um, you know, 10 joules per kilogram or a, a, an erg per gram, um, excuse me, 0.01 joules per kilogram um, um, or, uh, uh, you know, an ERG per, per gram. Um, as of some perhaps 20 years ago, uh, the, the, whoever's responsible for standards changed the, this into a, a gray, which is basically a joule per kilogram or 100 rads is, is equal to a gray. Now, when one talks about energy deposition, um, that is not quite the um, the relevant figure of merit for determining um, what the biological impact is going to be, what the biological damage would be. And here it depends very sensitively on what's causing, um, you know, what the radiation is, whether it's an alpha, whether it's a beta, whether it's a gamma, whether it's a neutron. Um, and so um, the old unit was called a REM, which stands for radiation equivalent man. Um, and now it's called the sievert based on the gray. And it is a, what's called a quality factor or an effectiveness factor, um, which uh, gives in some semi-quantitative way, a relationship between the energy deposition and biological impact based on the type of, of uh, radiation it is. And the people who do um, uh, sort of radiation biology and the medical physicists and so forth. Uh, this is kind of high art for them, but I think it's for us, it's just important to get, uh, it's sufficient just to get a, a general uh, quantification of it. In the case of uh, things which are lightly ionizing, like a, a, a swiftly moving beta particle an electron or an X-ray, a gamma ray, which will typically pop out by Compton scattering, um, knock out an electron and the electron will go careening at high speed through the material um, and for most of its path length deposit very little energy, that quality factor is one. So one rem is, uh, is you know, it results from one rad. When you get up to the alpha particles, which again are these very energetic but slow lumbering particles, 
uh, they're losing a lot of energy in a very, very short distance. Um, and um, similarly in neutrons, because neutrons will knock a proton, and a proton will again be a, non, a very slow non-relativistic particle lumbering through like a truck and be producing massive amounts of ionization in a very short distance. And you know, per micron or per 100 microns, we'll be losing a, an enormous amount of energy and causing a tremendous amount of local cellular damage and uh, genomic damage there as well. Um, so the quality factor there, the relationship between a rat and a ram or a gray and a sievert is a number like 10 uh, or 20. Okay, let me, um, uh, this I'm going to put up in the web. I've put the, the Glass, uh, Glassman and Dolan uh, paper up on the web already. Uh, let me get, uh, to, so I can turn this thing over to Mansouk to get started. Um, uh, we talk about LD50, in other words, how much radiation um, uh, it does a person absorb before uh, they are uh, beyond recovery. And um, in the old units, um, it was uh, around 500 rem, uh, where the, uh, the amount of damage the human organism sustains is that they will die uh, within a matter of days or weeks. Um, I think you remember seeing that little clip um, from uh, the 1981 movie, uh, I think Fat Man, Little Boy, uh, Paul Newman and others actually uh, had a reenactment there or a, a portrayal of the, um, uh, the, uh, the crit accident, the criticality accident in 1946 um, that uh, uh, where Louis Sloten, this young physicist, uh, was working there, you know, giving a demonstration to the new guys coming to Los Alamos and things, uh, uh, he slipped and the, all of a sudden they had the two plutonium hemispheres come together. Um, you had a uh, critical reaction, uh, massive amounts of radiation. And uh, he then measured the distance away with chalk uh, um, uh, where everybody was standing and was able to calculate that everyone else would be uh, would recover more or less, but but he would die. And in fact, he had calculated that he had received something uh, in excess of I think of a thousand rem or so. Um, the and this shows you the kinds of things even with modest amounts of uh, radiation damage, even a, a few rem. Um, if they take a blood sample, you can actually see the effects of that in your blood chemistry. And then uh, when you get up to about one tenth of LD50. Already, you will feel uh, fairly prompt uh, things like you'll, you know, uh, you'll have um, nausea, vomiting, and so forth. Very quick uh, hair loss and so forth. Um, if you think about, um, you know, uh, the the, bo the body and the various organs and systems in the body as being kind of a fuse box. Um, interestingly, what normally kills you when you get up to about LD50. Um, in, in fact, is due to damage due to what are called the crypt villi cells in your intestine. In your large intestine, you have these little cilia. Uh, they're there to absorb water. And uh, it turns out at the base of the, what's called the crypt, at the base of these little cilia-like cells, you actually have a, a stem cell. They create other cells which grow up the cilia and then slough off over a period of days. Um, but um, the, the human organism has evolved uh, to protect itself, and that is that if there's a sufficiently great of an insult to the stem cell in the intestine, um, it will commit what's called apoptosis, or sort of a cellular suicide. It's programmed that if it receives more than a certain amount of radiation or other kind of insult, uh, it will actually, um, uh, uh, it basically, it will uh, it's programmed to kill itself to avoid long-term cancer. And that happens, that's kind of the lowest, if you think of, of the human body as kind of a series of, of uh, electrical fuses, that one is the lowest fuse, that one is at about 500 rem. And that's what will get you uh, almost irreversibly when you receive that amount of radiation promptly is that you'll uh, basically, the crypt cells will die you'll get massive amounts of, of uh, 
intestinal bleeding, infection, and then that, that you're sort of irrecoverable at that point. Uh, much greater degrees of radiation, and then you will, of course, get prompt neurological damage uh, there, and you will see immediate effects in your inability to, to think and so forth. There's just a fallout pattern from a, uh, if uh, there is a near surface burst in Boston, you can see that um, uh, even uh, within a matter of days, even down to New York, you have, um, you know, uh, lethal amounts of radiation that, be, that could be deposited there. Um, here is a decay time of uh, activity of fission products as a function of hours. The prompt fission products themselves die off rather quickly. Interestingly, back in the early 90s, I remember meeting at a Christmas party once a youngish looking guy. I mean, he looked very young and vigorous and athletic, but he had been in the army, he was an enlisted man in the army in the 1960s. So by, I'd say he was probably in his 40s or 50 at the time or early 50s. Um, he had actually been part of these crazy exercises in Nevada before, uh, you know, we uh, agreed uh, the limited test ban to do all our testing underground, um, where the GIs would be there in a trench with their equipment on and their rifle, the, the bomb would go off, it would be a low yield, maybe 10 kilotons or something like that, fired from artillery rocket a, a, couple, a couple of miles away. And after 30 minutes, the CO would blow a whistle, they'd get out and they'd start marching in after the mushroom cloud had dispersed and they'd go marching in right into ground zero. And uh, to simulate what war fighting would be like in Europe in a limited nuclear engagement with the Russians and the full to gap. And amazingly, he did that <laughs> five times. He went out, he was actually took part in five of these exercises where they marched in you know, did some simulated exercises 30 minutes after the bomb went off right there, um, you know, went back, took a shower, went about their business. And, and uh, so you, you see, it was perfectly fine um, for him. Don't try this at home, but okay. Uh, last thing here, I think, and I'll quit uh, or one a couple more things. Uh, again, this is an important thing to pop, to educate the populace about um, radiation. People don't realize how much radiation we get uh, in our normal lives. In fact, this is sort of a pie chart of the radiation that people uh, receive on an annual basis. It's not like every person receives on the average of this because most of us don't have a, uh, you know, a CT scan. Uh, there are a few people who have real problems that receive lots of CT scans and get a lot of radiation per year. But average over the whole populace, you see a quarter of the, of the radiation that people receive uh, is in CT scans. And about a total of half of the radiation they receive is in one form or another of radiation, uh, radioisotopes or machines. You, you and I all go in every two years to get our teeth x-rays or x-rayed as part of our dental hygiene program. You get a lot of radiation just to the fact that we live at the Earth's surface. There's radiation coming you know, one part of everything in the Earth's crust, or one part in 100,000 is uranium and thorium that's emitting alpha particles and gammas and so forth. You can't escape it. There's radon uh, fission products which are being released from the, the Earth's surface and will accumulate in your houses uh, and so forth. So, uh, and this is the way it is. Uh, people like pilots and, and um, um, flight attendants uh, who are going back and forth across the United States several times a week um, are receiving a significant amount of radiation. Um, I think a trip across the US at 39,000 feet is something like the equivalent of a chest X-ray and it's not a big deal, you know, so that's, that's life. Last thing, uh, a very high altitude burst. Um, people, I, someone at, early in the, in the uh, course asked about EMP um, uh, of course, um, since uh, going back to the beginning, countries have realized that if you do bursts at the edge of the atmosphere, uh, you can actually get an, get an asymmetric uh, development of the fireball. You can actually get a separation of charge. So the thing acts like an antenna and can radiate immense amounts, couple immense amounts of electromagnetic power into uh, at large distances. This was called Starfish Prime. It was a test done uh, 250 miles up. It was uh, sent up by a rocket. 
uh, went off. It was a, a sort of one and a half megatons. And um, I don't know whether they were thinking about this or not, but it basically knocked out a good part of the electrical uh, system in Hawaii, almost a thousand miles away. And of course, mm -hmm. countries have actually planned to build weapons that would do maximum amount of damage uh, to adversaries, um, power grid and so forth. With that, I'll quit and turn it over to, uh, or for questions, and then turn it over to Mansouk. Hi, Professor. Uh, I had a question. This is Sam speaking. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what is, if any, the physical limiting factor for the yield on a weapon? I mean, um, like, for instance, for Star Bomba, why did they stop at 50? Why didn't they go to 100 or 1,000? Um, I'm talking about physical limit, like not, uh, not airplane capability or. Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, the Tsar Bomba, um, interestingly, was um, a three-stage weapon. So you can actually use the primary to ignite a secondary to create even more x-rays to compress a third um, stage. Um, you might say what uh, people have studied this, and I think Edward Teller studied this. Um, it turns out at some point, you, you, there's probably no end to how large a weapon you could make. But from the point of view of its effects, uh, as Teller, in other words, realized, at some point, all you're going to do is simply take a sort of a column of the atmosphere and sort of eject it into space. Um, and, uh, and you're not going to do much more than that. Um, so in principle, one could create larger and larger devices. Uh, it's uh, just that there's not really a great purpose to it. In fact, I think there would probably not be a great military purpose to building anything as large as the Tsar Bomba. Um, the Russians, I think, were aware of the fact that the precision of their early ICBMs was uh, not a match for the, the U.S. systems and therefore uh, were countering that by having larger yield weapons. But of course, they got better at the, the, the uh, targeting as, uh, as everybody else did um, hmm. years, uh, years later. To avoid the column problem, couldn't they just keep detonating at higher and higher altitudes? Well, then, of course, um, yeah. Yeah. And, limits. yeah. I see. All right, thanks. OK. I had one other quick question. Uh, this is James speaking. Um, what was the original motivation for doing underground tests? I was wondering if that was more due to uh, alliances that were or treaties that were signed, or if it was in order to keep some information about the testing secret. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, and the, um, the answer is uh, probably both. But I think initially, I think um, uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy were aware that the public by that time, I think, was, was getting quite upset uh, by this. Um, and, um, you know, by uh, the fallout issues, it had become a big deal. Um, you already had uh, various movies uh, and so forth being uh, created about uh, the perils of nuclear war, propaganda and so forth. And they, these things were right. I remember when I was a kid, uh, you know, when I'd go to the dentist, my dentist was telling me, he says, well, you know, it looks like uh, uh, I, I, everybody, mothers were worried about strontium-90 ending up in the bones and the teeth of their children. And I probably have strontium-90 in my bones. Uh, but uh, so, um, uh, I, th I think it was primarily a reaction to the fact that we just couldn't keep popping off many tens of these weapons in the atmosphere per year. Um, but of course, when you went underground, you raise a very good point. Um, the, um, uh, there, that now, if you uh, do tricks, which are called decoupling, one could probably be setting off low yield weapons that might be undetectable seismically. In fact, uh, I think you, many of you probably saw, and I think it was in the Saturday Wall Street Journal or late last week, there's now concern that the Chinese and their Lapnor facility in Western China, um, there's been a lot of activity there um, indicating they may be conducting low yield tests to circumvent um, you know, the ban on underground testing. Um, they themselves, like the Russians after the you know, um, the debacle they had, you know, pulling up from the Earth Sea that failed uh, nuclear rocket and then it went critical and blew up on them, um, you know, turned off uh, their radiological monitoring station and their seismic stations in the area at key times, which is very suspicious. 
Um, so yes, if you go underground and you're sufficiently clever, you could probably conceal a uh, low yield type testing, but the low yield types are extremely important to do. Further questions? Hi, this is Michael. Can I just comment briefly on the underground testing as well? Sure, go ahead. Um, so yeah, just to follow up on what Professor Van Biber said, there was increasing uh, political opposition in the US to atmospheric testing because of the strontium-90 issue. And uh, remember in October 62 was the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, which scared the hell out of Kennedy. And he told his colleagues that he had to do something to curb the nuclear arms race in some way. And uh, this led to the limited test ban negotiations uh, with I think Abel Harriman, who was governor of New York as the lead negotiator. And um, they formulated a plan where there would be, testing would be prohibited in the atmosphere um, at sea, uh, but not underground. And the reason for underground was Kennedy was very concerned that the treaty would not receive the support of the Joint Chiefs in Senate ratification hearings. But the Chiefs did their own study and claimed that nuclear weapons development could proceed unabated just through underground testing. So uh, in other words, he would get the support of the Chiefs to ratify the treaty the nuclear modernization program would continue, but everything would be uh, uh, prohibited except underground testing. And that's what happened. The limited test ban treaty was signed in 63. Uh, and that was Kennedy's major nuclear arms control achievement before he was assassinated in uh, November 63. That's all. Michael, did you see the report about uh, Lopnor? I did. Yeah. I did see it. And yeah, I think it's quite worrisome uh, given the lack of uh, transparency by the Chinese on COVID-19. This is <laughs> an added problem, which we don't need right now. I apologize. It looks like I chewed up the time, Mansuk. Uh, that's okay. Uh, we have a full day this Wednesday. And we want to hear from Professor Nacht as well on Korea, but we'll get that done. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, class, any final questions on procedure or substance before we call it a day? Again, again, if you want to chat with me on Wednesday, just contact us, contact Mansuk or myself between 1030 and 1130 on Wednesday. No problem. If you don't need to, no problem. Great. Okay. Bye, all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>